Good morning. I'm not Diane. <laughs> I'm Fran Turisco. I work with Diane. We have been working in this area for over 20 years, so I will spare you the uh, trip down memory lane. I think uh, Zach did a great job um, explaining how far we have come. And um, now we're going to sort of look ahead on where we are going because there's still a lot to be done. So um, my job here is to introduce the speakers and I'm going to start off by um, talking about uh, Global South. And um, this is an area that, um, although we call it panel of speakers, uh, you'll see that on your agenda, um, they'll come up one by one. and. Um, this is an area that has great potential because there are so many millions and millions of people, especially over in India, that really could uh, benefit from having I2B2 and uh, all of the other components. So with that said, um, I just want to make one note, which is uh, we have bios for all of our speakers. They're out in the back. I'm correct. So I will not bore you by reading a lot of uh, history on the speakers. Most of you know each other anyway. So let's jump in on our first panel. Um, so our first panel of speakers, um, we'll start with Paul Harris, who'll discuss uh, Red Cap and uh, I2B2 in developing countries. Uh, Paul will start with a background. Uh, and some developments on REDCap, and followed by Kavi, whose last name I still cannot pronounce. Uh, and he'll talk about I2B2's impact, followed by Dr. Praveen um, Jeetam. He's India's National Digital Health Mission Director and CEO. And he'll wrap up the, uh, the Global South discussion um, by talking about the use of I2B2 to securely perform analysis of EHR records. So I'm going to ask Paul to start, and um, Diane is our clock. She's our timer, so she'll give you the thumbs up when it's time to pass, pass it on to the next person. So Paul, thank you. I may need a little help with the uh, AV. So thank you very much. I'm, um, is this audio okay? Um, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. I'm Paul Harris from Vanderbilt University. And I want to talk about REDCap and particularly our, our history as well as our sort of story of uh, going into the international space with REDCap. Uh, as I was listening to Zach's talk, I was reminded that, uh, that we grew up about the same time. REDCap started in 2004, 2005. We, we wrote our first marker paper in 2009. So it's kind of fun listening to that. And thank you for the, uh, thank you for the history. So uh, REDCap, if you're not aware, REDCap is an electronic data capture uh, system. We, we built it uh, at Vanderbilt in 2004 really to support uh, any type of diverse clinical and translational research. Uh, when, when I talk about the REDCap consortium, that's basically the network of institutions around the world that are using it. So I'll, I'll use those two terms as we go along. Uh, as I mentioned, we started in 2004. And it was really around the, the uh, problem of implementing HIPAA security rules. Uh, so we'd been, been working for a long time as a clinical research center. We started seeing these HIPAA security rules coming down, and we weren't sure how that was going to impact the research enterprise. But we did, we did know that, uh, that, that how, however it was mandated, we, we had a ways to go in terms of how our research teams were collecting and managing and sharing data. And so. Uh, Problem was we had a lot of diverse researchers, a lot of diverse research at Vanderbilt, uh, and very few programmers. And so we came up with a metadata-driven uh, model, 
where if we can get the data about your data correct, then, uh, then the software can morph itself into being a good data capture tool for your study. We started with uh, case report forms, uh, getting the data in, uh, and we started with uh, audit trails. And that was about it, you know, in the very, very beginning. Uh, about, a, about a year after we started at Vanderbilt, uh, we, I, I was at a poster session at, at a NCATS, uh, sorry, what would become an NCATS uh, uh, institute uh, called the Clinical Research Center's uh, National Conference, giving this conference on how we were solving this pro problem at Vanderbilt. And this guy came up to me at that poster and, and subsequently several times during the meeting and said, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to use what you, what you developed there at Vanderbilt. The guy's name was Nathaniel Gonzalez and his boss was Jose Conde. Uh, I, 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 looked at the, I looked at what he was trying to do, I looked at what he, would, what he was asking to do with, in terms of collaboration or in terms of sharing, and I struck this really hard-nosed bargain with him. I said, you tell your boss I want 5% of your effort for, 30 per, for, for three months, and, and we'll make a go of this. So you can tell right away I'm not a businessman, because that's, a, that's sort of a silly amount of effort. But you know, he came back to me about a week, week or so later by email and said, yeah, let, let's make a go of it. Uh, we ended up getting about two years of 80% of Nathaniel's time. He was a great programmer, and his boss was a great biostatistician. And so, uh, I don't know. He went to industry down in Puerto Rico, and his boss is retired. But, but his boss was a statistician, and so the first thing that, that we had Nathaniel do was create an export module, get, 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 the, get those data that we're collecting into SPSS, R, Stata, uh, SAS, wh whatever you'd like. So, so the next year, the two of us were presenting this poster. I, I promise I won't go through every one of these. This will be the last one. But we, we were uh, presenting this poster, same meeting, and these two guys, uh, who I think are still around, uh, decided they, they wanted to sort of join this consortium as well. And so we had them create the, the authentication piece, thinking that if we, if we do this many times, we're going to need to be able to sort of drop in authentication mechanisms that, support, that can support multiple institutions. Uh, much later, wrote a paper on the REDCap consortium telling that story, and it's really a bunch of lessons learned, uh, both, both the, the good, the bad, and the ugly around sort of moving from one institution to two institutions to 10 to 100 to 1,000. Uh, and so if you're interested in that story uh, and those lessons learned, uh, please, please take a look at that paper. You can see on the, the, the graph on the top right, uh, you know, we, we were in existence about four or five years before we started getting international uh, uptake, but, but once we did, it followed the same pattern that we saw in the domestic side. First the academic institutions, then the nonprofits, and then the government uh, institutes. So today, or at least yesterday, we were at 6,000 institutions across 147 countries, and so we've grown quite a bit as a consortium. Uh, but, but, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out here uh, is, is that, you know, our goal has never been about, uh, you know, dots on a map. They're fun. They're, they're nice to evaluate, but, but that's not why we're, we're in business as REDCap. We're really there to support that, that driving need of collecting and managing data. But, but the reason the, map, the dots on the map matter, the reason those relationships matter is really uh, threefold. There's the technical platform. There's the professional home for folks that are using REDCap. And there's, then there's that benefit to society. And I want to go through just a little bit of, on each of those. So uh, this is from that paper that I mentioned earlier, this graphic. And it really describes very well, I think, how, uh, how REDCap works from a technical uh, development and feature prioritization standpoint. So over on the left, we've got our, our team at Vanderbilt who does uh, most of the development for REDCap. We sort of listen to what's coming in from the community. Uh, we prioritize that, and then we build it, test it, disseminate it out. Uh, that, that then sort of hits the hands and the, and the eyes of a bunch of uh, uh, liaisons uh, across the world at these institutions. They then sort of socialize it, train their end users, uh, put, it, put it out in the field. And, and then they hear things like, hey, this is great, but it would be really great if it used the smart on fire technology that Zach mentioned earlier and connected to an EHR or, or did any number of things. So we take those suggestions, put those back into the prioritization queue, and then start the circle again. We release about 12 uh, feature releases per year. Uh, and so if you think about from 2006 to now times 12, 
you know, that's, that's a lot of releases, and so that's a lot of spins around that, that uh, infinity diagram. But, but as we started moving into the international space, uh, we, we were, we were uh, challenged by, uh, by the problem that uh, if we're moving out into international, and particularly low and middle, middle income countries, um, there are internet scarce areas. And so Zach, I don't know if you remember it, but you came to Vanderbilt a long time ago, and, and I was describing this to you and, and you, and you called it out immediately. You said the problem is gonna be synchronization. And that's exactly what the problem was. Uh, so, so we worked on it, we, we would shelf it. Uh, sorry, the, it being a mobile app that didn't need the internet as we were uh, sort of collecting data out in the field. So, so we probably ran that through the, through the uh, development cycle about three times, each time getting a little bit too, little, almost there, but scared to launch because we didn't think we, should, we could support it. And then finally we did. Finally we put it out in, the, in the, uh, uh, both the Google Play Store as well as the, the, the Apple Play, Apple, what do we call that? Apple. App Store, right. Put them out there. We thought we'd solve this problem because we've got that synchronization in. Research coordinators out in the field uh, can, can go and collect their data, uh, sync it up when they get back. Went to an Africa meeting, went to a Red Cap Africa meeting, uh, which is sort of a smaller consortium in, on the African qu continent. Said, okay, we've got it solved. Let's hear the stories. They said it's not working. And um, I said, of course it's working. You know, we figured it out. You know, it works whether you, when, you know, when you come back, we've got these fail, foolproof ways to get the data in. And, and what they told me was, it's not working because you were assuming that, that it's a binary thing, that you either have the internet connectivity or you don't at any given time. And what you, what you fail to account for is that, that you might have it for a short burst of time and then you don't have it, or, or, or you know, it's, it's sporadic even when you have connectivity. So I went back to Vanderbilt and uh, sent, sent our folks back to the drawing board and finally solved it, and, and you know, it's, it's been a really nice product. But I think it's a great lesson learned from, from the perspective of, you know, you've got to listen to your users, and particularly that international uh, space. You know, there, there are challenges and uh, problems that they face that, uh, that, that frankly we won't see unless we listen, unless we go. Um, a few years ago, we wrote the marker paper for that RedCap mobile app. Uh, the marker paper is kind of how we describe things like, you know, let's get it out there in press so other people can cite us. Until you have that, it's kind of hard to know the, know, know the impact that you're having, or at least it is for us. But in that paper, we were able to find uh, through Google searches and connections with the consortium, you know, at least one use case on every continent, and you see those here. But, but more importantly, we saw you know, lots of user uptake. Uh, this is, this is uh, coordinators in the field with, uh, with that REDCap mobile app. You can see most of those, or a lot of those, are coming from low and middle income countries. So, uh, you know, why this matters as well, the consortium piece for us in going international is that professional home. A few weeks ago, I was creating another talk uh, for the REDCap conference that's coming up, and uh, it was September 7th. And about 6 a.m., I'm logging on and I'm trying to uh, put together these slides. And I thought, well, I'll just go to the community site where all of the different REDCap coordinators are out there sort of conversing. Uh, and it's 6 o'clock in the morning, and I found within, you know, you know a, a page uh, load that, you know, my, my first four comments of the day were already there and, you know, within the last hour. And then I kind of looked at, well, who are those individuals? And the first one was from Belgium, and the second one was from England, and the third one was from Australia, and the fourth one was from, from Germany. And I, I didn't go any farther than that. But I thought, you know, if you sort of think about what time it is in Nashville at 6 a.m., this sort of makes sense. The guy from Australia was staying up late, I, I think, but, but everybody else is sort of this, this is sort of the last handoff before it hits, hits the East Coast. And so it's really nice from that international spectrum of being able to, to sort of get answers when you need it uh, from, from our community. And then I kind of looked a little bit, little bit deeper in the discussion leaders and the community supporters and really, you know, the, the magic of REDCap in that professional home is that people really do invest, people really do uh, uh, ask, uh, and, and, they, and they also give answers to a lot of support questions, a lot of types of uh, use cases throughout the day. Um, this is our first, much like you guys, we're, we're just coming back. We're over in a hotel about uh, two miles from here. Uh, thanks to Diane and, and crew. But, uh, you know, last time we were together was in 2019 uh, in Vancouver. And there was a guy walking around with a camera. And he became our official photographer for that, that meeting. 
But the thing that the, and we gave him a spirit award, but we really didn't give him a spirit award for that. We gave him a spirit award for this. So, so I, I know, right? <laughs> so I came back home and I said, man, you're not going to believe this. Uh, I, I don't even have a red cap tattoo. But, uh, but you know, it really does just, just sort of show the, the commitment and the, you know, sort of the, the, the fun that that consortium has. And that's, that's a big part of it is that uh, consortium and the liaisons. And, and then finally, society. It's, it's fun to develop software. It's fun to have a community of folks that we hang out with. But, but more important, or the most important, is why we developed it in the first, time, first place, and that's the societal impact. So, so we have, uh, across that consortium, about 2 million historical users. They're not, they're not all live today. That's, uh, that's since we've been tracking. Uh, but if you take the, the marker paper for the REDCap, which was just published in 2009, and uh, look at the alt metrics and the citations, we've kind of made it easier as people are using that export module that I mentioned earlier easy to, uh, to, to click that and say, hey, you're probably publishing. Be a good time to write this into your methods and, and have, have your paper cited here. And so we've got 20, 20 22,000 uh, citations. And that's a really nice, nice thing because it allows us to go look at who's using it and for what, at least things that have gone on through publication. If you look at those alt metrics again, you sort of see that it's not all in biomedical research. We've, we've made a point of, of making REDCap as generic as possible so that smart people, you know, using uh, scalable tools can go do their own thing. If we look at um, Web of Science, you see there's a lot of different, uh, different domains in the biomedical literature, uh, and a lot of those domains REDCap is, uh, is supporting. My very favorite story of REDCap, this one comes from South Africa as well, my very favorite story uh, from REDCap was being down in uh, Johannesburg, going to Soweto, Soweto, which is a really, really uh, impoverished area, and going to, to meet with this researcher named Jenny Coetzee. Jenny, uh, Jenny was in a building, it took us, took us an hour at, almost to find where she was on this medical camp, compound. Once we got there, I, I noticed that we were uh, we were locking doors behind us. You know, they were like uh, big iron bar doors. So we'd go through a door, we we they they'd lock it behind us. We must have done that two or three different times. I'm thinking, man, what am I getting myself into here? And then we sat down at a conference table, and there are always all these ladies and Jenny Coetzee, and she started started presenting her research to me, and, and she basically studies. Um, sex workers and, and the conditions and the policies and the, the issues related to uh, the health issues and safety issues related to sex workers in this really, really uh, difficult and challenging uh, uh, environment. And, and the, the longer we, we, we got going with that meeting, the, the more I realized these ladies start asking me questions. And then I realize it finally hits me. These ladies are actually people that uh, they're, they're, they're individuals that Jenny has hired out of that environment to come to work for her in the research space. So it's a beautiful social engineering uh, model that she created. And these ladies were asking questions about, you know, hey, when I do this in red cap, it, it does that. Or, or, hey, this is great, but it would be really great if it did that. And I realized, you know, you, I could close my eyes. I could be at Vanderbilt University talking to a bunch of coordinators. And these, these individuals are that sharp. They're that well-versed on it. And so my very favorite story is, uh, is, is really sort of along the theme of helping really great people, brave people like Jenny Coetzee, do, do, do really great things. And so that's uh, that one I wanted to bring up for sure. So, uh, you know, Red Cap's secret sauce. I, uh, Diane asked me for a title a few weeks ago. I couldn't think of anything, so I, I started just kind of bantering around and thought, secret sauce, uh, and then it didn't make sense as I was creating my talk. But, but kind of bringing it back, I, you know, I think the secret sauce is the people. You know, it's, it's not the technology. It's the people that are listening to those end users. It's, it's the people that are training those end users, and, and it's folks like Jenny Coetzee that are doing the work. So I want to thank uh, my team at Vanderbilt, uh, thank the consortium, and especially thank, uh, thank you guys here. All right.